Could you please give a warm welcome to our very own resident agent provocateur, Martin Troyer. All right, I'm here to talk about typed functional programming languages. Finally! <laughs> uh, you know, functional pro programming is, is a religion with many churches. And every now and then, as a closure developer, you kind of wonder what's going on in the other churches. The grass seems, seems so green. What are they doing? So that's a bit what, I, what this talk is about. It's looking beyond with kind of a closureist glasses on. Um, looking at some of the type languages um, and well, could we use them? Are they good? So it's a talk in two parts. Uh, the first part is me ranting about types. Uh, the second part is kind of a survey of some of these languages where I say this is language X and this is why I hate it. <laughs> I don't hate all of them but some of them. Um, yeah and before we get any further, we should acknowledge the obvious thing that the real talk, the real title of this talk is All Roads Lead to Haskell. It is not. <laughs> okay, so disclaimer, this is an extremely subjective talk. Um, this is, you're looking into my distorted view of reality here. And I'm no more expert than you, so please don't take any bold statements I make as, you know, conflicts, you know. I have my opinions, you have my opinion, let's all be friends. You know, but just friends. <laughs> but the point is, your mileage will vary, and that's all fine, it's perfectly good. Um, so who am I? So I've been, been a developer for roughly two decades, a quarter of that time. I've been doing closure professionally. Um, before and during and after, I always looked at other languages. Uh, some of them I've worked more with is like F Sharp, Elm, Haskell, Scala, and Scheme. Um, I worked on several kind of big complex closure projects, like bigger than 30K lines, I think, kind of uh, uh, qualifies. Um, mostly web apps. So, another disclaimer here is that. Um, I'm looking at this from a kind of web app developer's point of view. Uh, there are many other applications of programming languages, of course, but that's mainly where I'm coming from. So it's backends, frontends, that's the kind of thing. Okay, um, so part one, there must be a better way. Um, so I would classify everybody, or most people who kind of are into these kind of conferences and functional programmers as kind of explorers, right? We reject the status quo, you know. We, we can't, you know, all of us have been there as a Java developer, C++ developer, but there's been like a voice in your mind saying, there must be a better way, there must be a better way. And this voice is louder in somebody, some people than anybody else. It's particularly loud, I think, for me. But, um, so we are exploring. I mean, we are using Clojure, we're using FP for a reason. But one point I want to put across, once you've taken that leap, and let's say you pick Clojure or Scala, that voice doesn't go away, at least not for me. It's still there, right? So the, 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 we can always approve, we can always look for better ways of doing things. And there's always a bigger fish, right? The, the grass is always greener in another church, always. Um, so my advice, always be looking. So, uh, after five years of closure, um, this is where I'm at at the moment, kind of. This is the stuff I really value, and one of the things I've, it's so, so important for me now is the top one here, which I call refactor with confidence. So this is working with the code base. Um, not the big refactorings where you go away for two months and changes everything. It's the day-to-day -day living with the code base. You know, doing the small changes and doing them with confidence. So I don't want to... I don't want to keep the entire complexity of all my code in my mind. I want to do my little change, do some testing on it or automatic checking, and then I should be confident that, okay, I haven't broken anything. That's, I've come to value that enormously. Um, and also, another thing is this, what I, why I say scaling. So it must be easy to kind of, for the 
if the code grows, it shouldn't be a massive problem. The code should be allowed to grow if it's solving problems. And that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be a cause of concern that, oh my god, it's so big now we, we can't work with it anymore. And you, you should be able to pile on people on the code, uh, on, the, on the project without any problems. And the other thing, you should be able to come back to code three months later to three years later and do a little change without having to reload all the subtleties you had when you wrote it. Um, the other thing that we all know is the earlier you catch them, the better. So I'm talking about bugs, bugs here, really. So that is true for everything, manufacturing, and it's super true for writing code as well. Whatever you do, whatever, whatever tools you have, if they help you do this, they're going to be a big, big benefit. OK. So now, uh, when I look, go out and look for, for, uh, for languages that I want to survey, like uh, what else is out there, here's a little checklist. Uh, that I'm looking for. So it needs to be FP, so I'm writing high order functions kind of as a catch all for an FP language. Nulls, you know, that I'm too old for nulls. I'm, I'm, I'm over nulls. I don't want to see an MP ever again in my life, okay? They're dead to me. Uh, Im values instead of variables is awesome. Immutability first, you know, immutable data structures, absolutely. Pattern matching is amazing. Once you start modeling your data with ADTs and can do pattern matching, you can't go back. Good type system, I'm coming back to that, what I mean by that, and control effects, I'm also coming back to what I mean by that. So this is kind of my checklist, right? And when we go to look at languages, we're gonna see if they, if they fulfill this or not. So let's talk types then. And this is the really tricky subject. A lot of things have been said. And there's a lot of misconceptions, and it's also a very vague term because it, there's many different kinds of type systems. So by dramatically you know, um, oversimplifying things, I can say there are naughty types and good types. So it is kind of the old C-style language, uh, C-style types, which are quite limited. And, yeah, and then we have kind of normal or modern ML style types. And when I say I like type languages, I'm, I'm not even thinking about Java. It's not, it's not part of my world. Um, I'm firmly in here. So what categor categorizes bad types then? So I would say they are kind of punitive, which means it feels like a shore, right? You, you, there's so much typing going on, uh, typing types, that it feels like, OK, I'm now I'm doing all this extra work just so the guy who wrote the compiler could have an easier life. I mean, it's completely the wrong way around, right? The compiler guy should work for me, and I shouldn't work for him. Um, they're, also, they're also too simplistic, right? They're too stupid. They're not powerful enough to, for, to express the kind of construct that's going on, which leads to all this madness of, uh, you know, design patterns and workarounds and stuff that's so convoluted, but this, you, you, you kind of comp you create this kind of meta that in, in, the, in the code that is just there to express an underlying idea, but it's so much clutter to actually write it down. Um, so what categorizes this is a lot of clutter and repetition over where, everywhere and a lot of discipline required to, to actually write good programs. Good types are more powerful. They're not perfect, but you can, you can succinctly describe a lot more what's going on. Look for buzzwords like type classes, higher kind of types, rank n types, all this good stuff. This is all great. Don't run away from it. That's, you know, when the people talk about that, that's good types. Type inference, you know, get rid of all that clutter. Here's some other stuff. Uh, so, yeah. Obvious things. You know, it's up to date documentation that's, that stays checked and some other stuff that's really a talk for XT17. Okay, let's talk about controlled effects as well. Um, uh, so control effect is something I've been dancing around for many years. And I, I always thought that, you know, you know, the Hasklers, they're going too far here. I mean, come on. Where's the pragmatism? Um, but I've come to realize, and Chris here in the audience is uh, also, you know, is one of the reasons that it's, it's really, really useful. And what, by the way, maybe not everybody in the audience is, is, you know, understand what it is, but 
for closure, think about it as side effects as data. So instead of just doing a side effect right away, we create a little recipe for doing that, and we can kind of put it in a container, we can inspect it, we can filter it, and then when we're done with it, we give it to the runtime and say, okay, please go and do these things now. So maybe that can give you kind of a hint on what we're going here, and also being able to precisely know which part of the code is pure is, it is a game changer. But it, it's taken me a long time to get there, but it's really, I, I believe now firmly that it's, it's really important. Okay, rant part over. How am I doing on time? Okay, perfect. So now the survey part, what else is out there? Um, so I'm, I wanna be pragmatic here, you know, I don't, look, I don't look for a language that rules them all. It doesn't have to be both back end and front end. I can live with different languages there. It's fine. Um, but it's more than the language as well and the type system. If you want to adopt a language, you have to kind of worry about more things. You have to worry about, can I run it in production? Where is the libraries? The tooling, the docs? How do I deploy this thing once, once I built it? Um, can I log? No, some of the languages, you kind of can't. Uh, can I monitor it when it's running? Is it about to fall over? You know, is the, is the heap growing too much? Stack trace is a big thing, you know. Maybe you can't have them. And also, if, you, if I have performance problems, can I, can I find out what part of the code is slow? This is not obvious things when you move into the type churches. Um, so it has to be good, but it also has to kind of work in a production setting. So that's kind of what I'm looking for when I evaluate these languages. So let's start with the big one, the Mac Daddy, uh, Haskell. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> Haskell J. Obviously, my, you, if you, my, my checklist is kind of reverse engineered from Haskell features, right? So <laughs> it's gonna fool, it's got to be full marks, fantastic. It's been, a long, for a, been around for a long time, so I would, I would say the compiler is very mature. The runtime is mature. Even though it's not like a third party, it's not like a Java thing. It's, they have their own compiler, they're writing out you know, bytecode themselves, they have their own garbage collector, everything. The entire runtime is, is the Haskell runtime, which might sound scary, but it's been around for so long, so, such a long time now that I'd say that it, yeah, it is stable. Um, compiler is fine. Um, tooling. You know, the, the slogan for Haskell has always been, you know, avoid success at, at all costs. And, <laughs> and tooling is something they haven't really cared about that much. Um, they tried a bit with Cabal, and then they had Cabal Hell, and they gave up again. And then some people have come in now, so I think recently in the last two years, the tooling situation has really rapidly improved. So it's really, really practical to use now, and not, a lot of the annoyances a few years back has been solved. There's also quite a lot of libraries. I mean, you can't compare it to Java for sure, but um, there are a lot of there. And some of them are even, you know, good. And uh, so all the basic stuff you want to do, Connect to a database, you know, web servers, connect, do REST calls, all that stuff is there and it's pretty damn good actually. Um, so if you want to convert your basic ring app, sorry James, you, you can. It's not a big deal and it's, it not, it's not much bigger and it's kind of nice and everything kind of works. Uh, some downsides, lazy evaluation. So that's, that's kind of the poster idea of, of Haskell, right? Um, it's one of the very few languages that actually do that. And there's a lot of power coming from it, but it also has, so on, a, on an intellectual level, it's fantastic, but on a, on a practical level running in a production, there, there are some things you have to think about. You know, it's, it's harder to figure out what part of your, if, if your code blows up, it's harder to understand you know, which, which part of your program is really big or which part of your code is really slow because you don't really have a call stack, You're like call stack lol. What you have is an execution stack and since everything is lazily evaluated, 
it doesn't really follow your mental model of the code. Code gets evaluated in any old order, basically. So that's a thing you have to spend a fair amount of your, maybe a fair amount of your, um, your consciousness on when you're write, running Haskell programs in production. Like library ec ecosystem is kind of far from Java, um, but most of the stuff is there. It's still practical to use pretty much anything that I do for web apps. Um, Docs is, has always been a problem with Haskell, but I think the attitude is, well, we have type signatures. Why do you need docs? Come on. Which is not super helpful, but uh, that's definitely something that could be improved. And then you have the problems with maybe, so logging is not straightforward in Haskell either. You have to worry about that. Um, so there are definitely downsides. Uh, it's not a, you know, a clear win on all, on all fronts. When we're talking about Haskell, we have to mention the M-word. <laughs> and the M-word has been so massively oversold, it's, it's really not that complicated. I mean, this is, this is what it is. <laughs> so, so one of the things with, with, yeah, so one of the things with Hasklers is that a Mona is a very simple construct. And what they do is, okay, we discovered something potentially interesting. And now we're going to pet, put 20 PhDs for 10 years and really go deep and see what it actually means, you know? And then it turns out that this is a really, really important construct that, that could lead to a lot of things. But if you actually just look at the types and you look at the implementation in the core libraries, it's like 10 lines. That's all it is. There's nothing to it. It's the implication of it. And I think there's a lot of fear and doubt built up around this, but one thing that's, that's cool when you're working with Haskell day to day is if you just look at the type signatures, it's not that hard. It's pretty, pretty obvious what you need to do and how things kind of line up. And then you can go crazy on the category theory, theory et cetera, if you want to, but you really don't have, you don't, really don't have to, to be like a productive Haskell developer. Okay. Let's move on. Elm. So terminal velocity on the hypometer, you know, if, if you're a front-end developer and you haven't written a, an L map, you know, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> um, so this, this, is, this is what all the cool kids are doing. Um, here's my take on it. Good bits. My checklist, amazing. Controlled effects in the front-end, yes, perfect, wow. That really helps, believe me. Um, at my current company, we are kind of migrating from ClojureScript to Elm now, and um, I can only tell from, from the small team, we are, we are faster and we're writing better code with it. There's really no, no way around it. Um, it is still kind of new, but um, the core team is working with the, with the compilers and the, the framework are really good. They kind of produce high quality stuff, so I think in practice, even though it's new, it's, it's, it's of a high quality. Um, we haven't, certainly have had any problems, and it's, it's kind of, it's more immature, it's also pretty damn amazing. Uh, so one of the things they really push for is um, compiler errors, and really helpful compiler errors, and there's really nothing like it. It should be, it should be experienced. Because one of the problems when you have a really you know, flexible uh, type system is that, okay, the, the error messages, so the type errors can be very hard to understand and grok and long, but they have done an amazing job to really cut that down. It is a framework and a language, so, and it's highly opinionated, so you better use the Elm architecture if you use Elm, right? If you have a, if you have a problem that's kind of outside, you might be in trouble. There is a bit of magic in the framework to make your life easier. And if you're coming from Haskell and look at some of the type signature, for instance, for the equality function, you will go, hold on, that's not possible. Uh, so, but it usually mostly works if you keep inside the framework. And it's also a very small language. It's much easier to learn than if you're going full Haskell, right? You don't have to go full Haskell too to use Elm. <laughs> Never go full Haskell, oh, I don't know. Uh, so that's cool. Um, so opinionated architecture, it feels to me, if I want to be like a little snarky about it, it kind of feels like it's first and foremost a framework for writing web apps, and then there's a really cool DSL on the side to actually tie it all together. Um, 
which is ne not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if, 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 when it works, it works really amazingly. FFIs are a bit, so this is foreign function interface when we actually want to call out to Java. It's a bit special, but that one of the reasons why it is is because you have controlled effects, right? So it's a very, you know, event passing oriented architecture. And it works, but in some cases you wish for a more flexible FFI. Pure script. I like one minute left. Um, you know, JavaScript is one, deal with it. How do we deal with it? Elm is one thing, but what about JavaScript is also one on the back end, I'm, I'm sorry to say. So how do we deal with that problem? Well, PureScript might, might be the solution. So PureScript is kind of like Haskell for JavaScript. It's very close to Haskell. Um, it's very lightweight. It's not like a framework like Elm is. It produces small, kind of tight JavaScript. Um, FFI is a bit more straightforward. But it, that also means that it's easier for you to kind of blow your legs off um, if you're not careful. It runs well on Node. That's something that we're actually trying now in my company, so we're stupid enough to, to do that, or good enough. I mean, it's been working. It looks good so far. Uh, runs in the browser. Have really nice React wrappers. Um, so you can definitely run it in the, in the browser as well if you want to. Um, much more, it's newer and it feels more immature than Elm for sure. Community is tiny, but we have Bodil, so who cares? <laughs> um, libraries are coming along, but still missing, uh, especially if you're coming f thinking that it's kind of Haskell and you want it, and you maybe comparing it to GSC, JS, uh, you might find yourself lacking for libraries, but they're coming along. And it is JavaScript, so NPM and Bauer and all that stuff is now part of your life again. I think I wrap it up here. Uh, I have some more languages that I kind of ran out of time with, but um, I'll make the slides available. I'm writing about this in my blog as well. So here's some cool <laughs> oh, camel jokes, um, F sharp, etc. So, sorry. Um, in my blog, uh, you will see a longer write-up about each language, and they, it's, they're coming along in a, in a slow pace. But I'm also around this evening if you're particularly interested about OCaml or Frege or some of the other stuff. Okay. Okay.